Welcome to Manifest, hosted by international evangelist, teacher, and author Perry Stone. Enjoy unique insight into prophetic and practical truth. It's time to feast on fresh manna, so get ready to be blessed and encouraged. And now, here is your host and teacher, Perry Stone. Well, I am very excited to come to you from Jerusalem here in Israel. It's another beautiful day. We have our partners here. This is one of our partners' tours. What we do, we do, we do back-to-back tours, partners only, and then we do a main tour. And I have stood here, I can't even count you the number of times, and uh, of course, take manifest programs. And I always want you to know when it's a new one so you won't think you've seen this one before. And it's a new one because the shirt is new. <laughs> this looks like something, I don't know who bought this one, but this looks like something from the hippie movement. <laughs> so all you Colorado people that smoking dope right now and you see me, <laughs> I'm only kidding. I really am. I hope you're not smoking dope. Please don't smoke dope. So you're going to refer back, hey, man, I've seen that shirt, man, somewhere before. Okay. I've got to get serious because this is a real serious, this is a real serious message. So I'm going to, I'm going to talk about, and it's a, it is a serious message, but it's very powerful, on Satan in the Forbidden Zone. Now, what I want to do, I want you to pretend with me that, that the dome is not there and we have the Jewish temple that Jesus ministered in on the platform. Most of you are aware of the fact that in the temple, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use terms that are easy to remember, you have the outer court, you have the inner court, and you have the Holy of Holies. In the outer court are two pieces of furniture. You have a brass altar where they offer sacrifices, and you have a round laver for water where the priests would wash their hands and they could wash their feet as well in ministry. Then you come into the inner court and there's three pieces of furniture. If we're walking in this direction, you have over here the table of shoe bread, which are 12 pieces of bread that are baked and they're, they're, they're eaten once a week and new bread is put on that altar every week. And then in this direction here, you have the seven branch candlestick, which is the gold menorah, has seven branches, has oil in it, and it lights that inner court area. And then you have right in front of the veil, a huge veil was there. That veil was as thick as a man's hand, had 72 squares that were sewn together. And there was a room called the Chamber of the Virgins that existed in the temple. And this was the temple in Christ's day. And this is where they made a new veil about every two years. And the reason they had to make a new veil is because the blood was sprinkled on that veil. And after a while, uh, it would begin to sag and get heavy and they would replace it. So those veils were actually replaced from time to time. Then you had that golden altar of incense, which uh, of course was uh, used twice a day and 11 different types of incense were placed on it. And the incense is where the prayers of all the saints would go up and the smoke of the incense would go up before God. And then behind the veil, now, now this is interesting, is normally the Ark of the Covenant, but in the time of Jesus, the Ark of the Covenant was not behind the veil. Uh, most people don't know this, but after the Babylonian captivity, when the Jews returned and rebuilt the temple, the Ark of the Covenant was missing. And uh, there's two traditions. One is that Jeremiah hid it in a chamber under the temple mount. And I had a rabbi who was Rabbi Yehuda Getz. I bless his memory, great rabbi here in Jerusalem. Uh, he gave me access to the Western Wall tunnels at night. And I don't want to go into all the details, but he said he saw the Ark of the Covenant uh, under the Temple Mount in a chamber and it was in horrible condition. The cherubs were broken. There was old animal skins that looked like they were on. And I asked him, why don't you bring it out? He said, do you want to bring it out and cause World War III? He said, it's safer to be hid where it is than to brought it out. That's what he told us right over here in his office many, many years ago, about 1991. But the Ark of the Covenant was hidden or concealed sometime uh, before the Babylonian captivity in the time of Jeremiah, and it was never brought out. And I asked Rabbi Getz, why was it never brought out? And I don't want to get into all the details because now we're talking about the Ark of the Covenant, but there were reasons why it was never recovered and brought out into the second temple. So in Jesus' day, when the priest would go into the Holy of Holies, there was a hole in the ground and he would pour the blood into that hole, which would then come into a trench into the Kidron Valley. This below me right here, 
I'm pointing is the Kidron Valley, and the soil was very rich there, obviously because of the blood that was there and the protein that was in it. And the, they used to fight for that soil, the farmers used to, centuries and centuries ago. Now, having said that, most of you know that you have the outer court and the inner court and the Holy of Holies, and that represents, oddly enough, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 23, it represents the body, soul, and spirit. The outer court is the body because you have an altar and you have a labor there, and the altar is where you offer your body as a living sacrifice unto God, and the labor is water baptism, and when you're baptized in water, your body goes under the water. So see, there's your outer court, and then you have the inner court, which is the soul, the intellect, the mind, the will, the five senses, and in the soulish area, you have, that's, that's where you learn the doctrine because the 12 pieces of bread on the table of shoe bread can actually represent, oddly enough, the 12 major doctrines for believers that are in the New Testament. Salvation, uh, justification, regeneration, baptism in the Holy Spirit, doctrine of judgments, doctrine of laying on of hands, etc. There's 12. Then the menorah represents the Spirit of the Lord. Uh, and the anointing of the Lord, the holy oil and the fire that's in, on the menorah. And then the golden altar is according to the book of Psalms where prayers go up before God. That represents your prayer life and your intercession. So that's in the realm of the soul and the mind. And then there is the spirit. And in the spirit would be the Ark of the Covenant. Now, this is pretty neat. And in the Ark of the Covenant, based on a writing that Paul said in the book of Hebrews, were three items. There was the, the uh, manna, a golden pot of manna, and there was the tablets of the law, and there was the rod of Aaron. Now, the golden pot of manna represents salvation. The tablets of the law separated you from sin. That's sanctification, which that word means to separate for a holy purpose. And then you have the rod, which represented the miracles of the power of the Holy Spirit. So in your spirit is where the gift of salvation comes from. There's your manna, where sanctification originates, which separates you from a sinful life. That's the tablets of the law or the word of God. And then you also have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and he abides in your spirit. John 7, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. Is that interesting to anybody? Yeah. It's, pretty, it's pretty amazing, isn't it? Now, Going back to what I originally want to talk about, it's, I call this Satan in the forbidden zone. Now, since there is a body and since there is a soul and since there is a spirit, let me show you a pattern here. The Israelite, the Levite, and the priest, three groups, the high priest, the Levite, and the Israelite, three groups, were all allowed in the outer court area. The Israelite was not allowed in the inner court. Only the priest and the high priest were. As it relates to the Holy of Holies, the Israelite was not allowed in there. The Levite was not allowed in there. Only the high priest was allowed in the Holy of Holies once a year on the Day of Atonement. Now, having looked at it from this perspective, we ask ourselves this question. In the life of a believer, and we're all believers here. I don't think you ever go to, with Perry Stone to the Holy Land unless you're a believer. <laughs> I think you risk getting saved and filled with the Spirit and baptized in water and everything else if you come uh, on, on a Holy Land tour. But how far can the enemy go? Have you ever thought about this in the life of a believer? Okay, let's look first of all at the physical body. Our body is a temple of the Holy Spirit and the Spirit of God dwells in us. At the same time, we know in Luke chapter 13 that there was a woman who's a daughter of Abraham, meaning that she was in covenant with the Lord, that a spirit of infirmity had attacked her body. Now, it didn't attack her spirit. It attacked her physical body. And that word infirmity is the Greek word asthenia, and it's, it's a, it actually translates the actual literal meaning is a spirit of weakness. She was bowed over and she could not lift her body up. And yet we see that when Jesus prays for her, Jesus calls it an attack of Satan. He said, ought not this woman whom Satan hath bound be loosed on the Sabbath day. So spirits of sickness can attack the physical body of a believer. And it, this happens and there's no way of denying that even in scripture. Then what about the mind or what about the soul, all right? The enemy in Acts 10, 38, here's a verse. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed, now not possessed, it's a difference, of the devil for God was with him. You know it and I know it that there are believers 
who are tormented in their mind. There are believers that get oppressed. There are believers that get depressed. And I'm not going to give all the reasons as to why it can happen, but it can be at times an attack of a spirit of some kind. Now, here's what's interesting. The Satan is limited. And I realize, I realize that uh, uh, theologically there would be people that would differ with me with what I'm about to say, but I'm going to make my point in a moment. The Spirit of God dwells in the spirit of a believer. Would you agree with me on that? The Spirit of God dwells in us. And I go back to John 7, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. This spake Jesus of the Spirit, that they that believe on him should receive for the Holy Spirit was not yet given, for Jesus is not yet glorified. So the baptism in the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God dwelling in your spirit, man. It's interesting that Many years ago, because I came up in kind of a crossover of old classical Pentecost and what was called the charismatic renewal, which was with the Baptist and the, and the, uh, the Methodist and the Catholics. So I, I was kind of a crossover with those two groups. And in the charismatic renewal, there were people who were trying to cast spirits out of Christians and cast a spirit out of their innermost spirit. Now, I want to say this to you. The Holy Spirit would never dwell in a human spirit with a demon. Because Jesus said, I'm going to give you a little verse, a fountain cannot produce bitter and sweet water, and a tree cannot produce thorns and fruit at the same time. Now, can a demonic power attack the body? Yes. Can it attack the mind with fiery darts? Of course, because Paul warned about put on the helmet of salvation, and you've got to quench the fiery darts of the enemy. But it's interesting that when you look at the tabernacle itself, that the Holy of Holies is reserved for only the high priest. God would not even let a Levite in there. They'd, he'd strike them dead. God would not let a regular Israelite in there. He'd strike them dead. So what I want to share with you very quickly is this, how that the temple furniture, and I'm going to give you one verse for every one of these, how the temple furniture reveals God's blessing in every area of a believer's life. Let's look at the altar. On the brass altar, the chief, chief substance, of course, on that altar was blood. It was an altar of sacrifice. Revelation 12, 11 says, we overcome Satan by the blood of the lamb and by the word of our testimony. Okay, so now we have something that tells us how we overcome, which can be a picture of the blood on that brass altar. Then we come to the labor. Listen to Titus chapter 3 and verse 5. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he has saved us by the washing of regeneration and by the renewing of the Holy Spirit. So the labor is where you are washed, or we would say where you are renewed. So here we have a renewal that takes place through a picture of the laver. And then we find the table of shoe bread. That is a picture, I'm sorry, the menorah. Let's go to the menorah. That's a, the picture of revelation, illumination, light. The priest used to stand in front of the seven branch candlestick or the menorah, and he would have the 12 stones on his breastplate, and he would ask God a question, and the letters would illuminate on that breastplate. He could look down like this and read the letters and actually spell words as the menorah would shine on a particular letter that would brighten up. And this, is, this was called inquiring of the Lord, and it happened in the Old Testament quite extensively. So watch this. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So the altar is the blood of Jesus. The labor is the baptism in water and the washing of the water of the word. The menorah is the revelation that comes by the Holy Spirit, all right? And then we have the table of shoe bread, which is the reviving of your strength. Um, and then, and, and then we go to the golden altar, which is your intercession. Psalms 141 and verse 2, let my prayers be set before you as incense and the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Then Paul said, uh, Tim, wrote to Timothy and said this, 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 1, I exhort you therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. So the golden altar is your prayer life. It's where you worship. It's where you intercede. And then you come to the Ark of the Covenant, and the Ark of the Covenant, and I mentioned this earlier, is the fullness of the blessing of the Lord. It's the fullness of God's blessing. So I'm going to show you something 
something here. Now, stay with me because this is where it gets really interesting. What is it that will actually defeat the enemy? Now, most people, if they're full gospel, says, well, it's got to be the anointing of the Holy Spirit. The anointing of the Holy Spirit defeats the enemy. The anointing breaks the yoke, Isaiah 10, 27. God anointed Jesus to break the yoke of the lives of people. So the anointing absolutely breaks the yoke. But I want you to listen to 2 Samuel 3, 39. David said, I am weak this day, though anointed king. And then I want you to notice what Jesus said. After his baptism, when the Spirit of God anointed him, it says, and the Spirit led him in the wilderness to be tempted or to be tested of the devil. So the anointing, now listen to me very carefully. I want to be careful how I say this, that I don't be misunderstood. The anointing does not exempt you from being attacked by the enemy because Jesus was anointed and still tested. David was king. He was anointed. And the Bible says that in that anointing, he still had that experience of being weak. All right, number two, rebuking the devil does rebuking the enemy. <laughs> Let's just join in here, okay? There's some Hispanic brothers and sisters from, I think, uh, maybe from Mexico, and they, ha they have a time. We might as well shout with them. Let's just, let's just take a shout break. <laughs> I love it. That's, that's one of the things I love about being over here. You'll just, it'll just, they'll be breaking out and singing and praising God all at the same time. Now, does, does rebuking the enemy, is that the thing, let's say, that Satan fears the most? Because you could still be anointed and have an attack of the enemy. You'll discover that the disciples rebuked a demon in a boy and nothing happened because a rebuke becomes void if it's done in unbelief. Let me say it again. A rebuke becomes void if it's done in unbelief. If you don't rebuke in faith, then if you rebuke in unbelief, they couldn't cast that devil out of that boy because of their unbelief. Now think about this for just a moment. Does faith alone frighten the enemy? Is it just faith alone that stops? The, I don't know if y'all can hear this at home. These folks are having church. I'm just going to leave. I'm going to jump off the balcony right here. I'm going to run down here where those folks are having church. They're having, they're having a wonderful time. Does, does, does faith, having faith in God, is it the thing that Satan fears? Now listen to this verse. You believe in God. You do well. The devil also believes and trembles. So in other words, Satan has faith that God exists. He has faith that Christ is the Son of God. He knows it, but it's not saving faith. Now, without me just going on and on with these questions of what is it that, that the enemy is afraid of the most, what is it that would hold him back the most is I'm going to give you this verse that Jesus gave. Now, watch this. Satan tried to kill Jesus in Bethlehem. All children under two years of age were slain by the Roman soldiers. Men tried to throw Jesus off of a cliff in Nazareth. Remember that? And he walked through the midst of them, went his way. Then a storm arose and tried to drown him in a boat. It says the boat's full of water. You know, it's hard to sink a boat full of water when the man can walk on water who's in the boat. I mean, Jesus just gets in the middle of the boat, just stands on top of the water in the middle of the boat, you know? But nonetheless, it was an attack that could have drowned Jesus and killed him. Men right here on the Temple Mount centuries ago tried to stone Jesus with stones, and he escaped. But here's the thing that Satan feared the most about Jesus. Ready? John 14, 30. Hereafter, I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world is coming, but he hath nothing in me. Now, hang on. John 14, 30, another translation. I will not speak with you much longer for the prince of this world is coming. He has no hold on me. The Amplified, I think this is the Amplified, says it this way. I will not talk much with you more for the prince, the evil genius ruler of the world is coming and he has no claim on me. Now, this is what the Amplified said. He has nothing in common with me. There is nothing in me that belongs to him. He has no powerful hold over me. Here, yeah, go ahead. That's, that's, that's a powerful word. Now, here's the thing. The enemy tries to get into your life by attacking your physical body, or he tries to get into your life by mentally oppressing, mentally depressing, or the fiery darts, or let's say testing or temptation, the words we could use, various words. 
But the thing that I love about Jesus is he said, the prince is coming, but there's nothing in me for him to hold on to. That's what the enemy's afraid of. The enemy is afraid of you getting total victory. In every, and think about it. Think about this. In every area of your life to where there's nothing for him to hold on to. Uh, I like to say it this way. In the Roman time, they would take wrestlers and they would spend months greasing them down with oil before they went to a wrestling match so that when they went to wrestle, their skin was slippery. So when their adversary would try to grab them, he'd slide right off of them. And so God wants you to have the sliding anointing. Hey, watch out. Man. Really? So that when the enemy, so that when the enemy tries to put oppression on you, it slips off of you. When he tries to put depression, because I've battled depression in my life and I know what it feels like, but he slides it right off of you. When he tries to get you into something to put you in that captivity permanently, it slides right off of you. So the one thing he fears is not just an anointing, not just you having faith, not just you being in the Word, not just you having a prayer life, is for you to be able to say, you can hit me, but you ain't got nothing to hold on to. I'm not for you. I'm not going to stand with you. I'm not going to play your game. You have nothing to hold on to. So I want to encourage you today to tell you that you have every weapon already provided for you to walk with the Lord, love Him, and be an overcomer in your life. Uh, something brand new has come out. I've got to tell you about it. Hang on. Watch this. And we'll be back uh, in just a moment. Ephesians In Depth, The Warrior's Strategy is now being made available. Today, with so many spiritual conflicts and personal struggles, this teaching is urgently needed. This series was taped on a set using a Roman-type town with numerous replicas of Roman military equipment. You will experience 12 hours of teaching divided into 23 30-minute lessons on seven DVDs. That's right, seven DVDs. On this landmark series, you will discover how to sit in heavenly places, how to walk by faith, and how to stand in the evil day. Four of the lessons will teach you how to defeat the four types of satanic spirits that you wrestle with in life. You will also learn how a written and spoken word from God becomes a weapon called the sword of the Spirit. You will discover how to renew and restore your shield of faith and even see the various types of shields used during the Roman period. Two lessons will also teach you how to keep your feet from sliding into traps that are set by Satan in secret. Four lessons will reveal the battles that you will fight in the time of the end and a strategy needed to overcome in each situation. You can apply this teaching and it will help you to defeat the adversary in every area of your life. Every piece of Paul's armor will be presented in an exhaustive study, but the best part is that I will show you how to use this protective gear in your daily life. These seven DVDs with 12 hours of teaching, that's 23 distinct lessons, is available during this very special limited time offer. I want to send you this teaching, Ephesians In Depth, The Warrior Strategy, for your donation of only $95 or more. Order by calling toll-free 1-888-21-BREAD. Order online at perrystone.org, or if you wish to mail in your request, write Perry Stone P.O. Box 3595, Cleveland, Tennessee, 37320, and ask for offer EPH. 132. That's EPH 132. Take time to feed your spirit this revelation that I know is going to transform your situation. God bless you. It is my opinion that the offer that we're now making available through the Manifest Telecast because of the spiritual warfare, whether it's physical attacks, mental attacks, or spiritual attacks that people are under, is the most important series we've ever presented seven DVDs, all illustrated messages. We spent literally tens of thousands of dollars on the set and the equipment to present to you the book of Ephesians, The Believer's Warfare. Please take this moment and get this material while you can, while it's available to you, because you will hear so much. I'm telling you, it is a life-changing teaching. We're so happy to be able to present it to you right now on the Manifest Telecast. Very quickly, We'll be coming to Flowood, Mississippi on February the 22nd to the 24th. And I want you to go to perrystone.org to keep up with our itinerary. We're adding new places continually. 
Also, our Warrior Fest, our huge youth event is coming up back to back two weekends toward the end of March. Thousands are already registered. You need to get your registration in to ensure that you're able to get in there and be a part of this great anointing that God is going to release to this generation. Speaking of this generation, let me share something with you. In the scripture, it says that God would pour out His Spirit upon all flesh. This is in Joel 2, Acts chapter 2. And sons and daughters would prophesy. You know, when we talk about prophesying, people have different conceptions of what that means. Some simply say it means to preach the gospel or to proclaim a message. Others point out that th there is a gift of prophecy which uh, enables us to understand words of wisdom and words of knowledge and to give us information that we need for our life or for our personal situations or things we may be going through. Others point out that there is prophetic teaching, which deals with the time of the end, the return of the Lord, the signs of the time and things of this nature. I believe that it is a combination of all three. There is a generation coming up that's going to proclaim the Word of God boldly throughout the world. There's a generation coming up that God is going to restore the gifts of the Spirit. Not that they have ever been taken or lost, but because they have been neglected. And number three, there is a group of young people, and I guess this fascinates me more than anything else, that love the teaching of prophecy. You know, that's the reason why every year in April, we have an international prophetic summit, Jonathan Kahn, myself, Bill Cloud, Joel Richardson, Mark Biltz. Why do we do that? Because people want to know what's about to happen based on the Bible. And what I love to see, and I think this is very intriguing for me personally, it, it, you know, after being someone that loves prophetic preaching and teaching like so many of you do, is to watch the young people, the kids, children, and teenagers and young couples that are now becoming interested in what the Bible teaches about the future. And the great thing is, and I think this is a wonderful thing, is the Bible will tell you events that are going to happen, whether it's global events, whether it's national events, whether it's spiritual events, events of the church, things that are going to happen uh, nationally, internationally, in Israel, the Middle East, all over the world. It's clear. One third of the Old Testament has not yet been fulfilled, and 318 passages are in the New Testament that reveal Jesus is going to come back again. So while, while we are going to present to you in the very near future, and, and we're, we are presenting to you, of course, 38 new programs that I taught in Israel, and we, we taped them in Israel, and over, this, over the year of 2019, we're going to be presenting to you uh, pretty steady, week after week, the new teachings from Israel. And some of these I am so pumped up about because uh, the Holy Spirit gave me some absolute powerful Word of God revelation and insight while I was there. Don't you miss one program from Israel. And I want to also say I'm so grateful to all the networks that air the Manifest Telecast, especially our great Christian networks that are out there helping to reach the world with the gospel. Because when the gospel is spread around the world and people have the opportunity to hear Jesus said, then the end would come. So let me just encourage you to keep up with us through social media. Go to perrystone.org and you can get our itinerary. Please check that out. Take the opportunity. We have a lot of new things, a lot of things we're making available, new teachings, etc. And let me finally say that I'm very grateful to all the partners of our ministry. I hope you're enjoying the partners blog and the partners page and information and the nuggets and the nuggets from Israel that are all a part of our partners, uh, partner strike force group. Thank you so much for partnering with us. I want to say that from my heart. All right, next week we're coming back, and I want you to pay careful attention to what we're going to be sharing with you in that word. See you then.